Hello and welcome to the 2013 Sulphur Springs Union School District Candidates Forum brought to you by AM 1220 KHTS, The Signal Newspaper, COC Cougar News, and SCV TV. Voters in the Sulphur Springs Union School District will see four names for school board on their November 5th ballot, and three of the candidates are with us today. They are Ken Chase, Carrie Clegg, and Lori McDonald. Asking the questions today, we've got a panel of three local journalists uh, from the Signal newspaper. <laughs> we've got Luke Money. From COC Cougar News, we've got Taylor Villanueva. And from AM 1220 KHTS, we've got Perry Smith. And we're going to start off with opening statements. The first opening statement, well, the candidates have been selected in, in a random drawing, which we just conducted moments ago. Ken Chase got the nod to deliver the opening statement first. Ken, what you got? Hello, my name is Ken Chase. I'm running for the Sulphur Springs School District because I currently feel there is a void on the bo board. Currently, there isn't an accountant on the board. I'm a certified management accountant. And I feel it's very important to have someone on the inside uh, with my insight on the board um, to add a different perspective to make the board more well-rounded. I especially feel this is more important with the recent passage of the $72 million bond to ensure that the money is spent wisely in the district. I've been very involved in the district since 2004, serving on school site councils for six years, five years as chairperson. I'm currently chairperson of the Measure CK Oversight Committee and I have also done various um, board um, volunteer positions with the district. I've also been very involved in the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. I have a daughter with type 1 diabetes and I'm proud to say I've been named the Los Angeles Chapters um, Volunteer of the Year. Currently I work for a company in Pasadena called Pack Group where I'm the corporate controller and I feel that my insight will add a lot to the board so please vote for me on November 5th. Thank you. Next, an opening statement from Carrie Clegg. Okay. Hello. Go for it. Oh, my name is uh, Dr. Carrie Clegg. <laughs> I'm uh, currently sitting on the Silver Springs School Board. I was elected first in 1989, and I am currently a retired professor and research scientist from the Department of Veterans Affairs Hospital in the San Fernando Valley of which also I served for 10 years as the CEO and Chief Operating Officer of the Sepulveda Federal Credit Union uh, at that hospital location. Uh, currently, I'm still working part-time as a professional expert in the Simi Valley School District, teaching in respiratory therapy and pharmacy tech programs uh, with adults uh, looking for new training and, and uh, job career changes. Um, during my tenure on the Silver Springs Board, I have uh, amassed quite a bit of experience and a lot of, spent a lot of time dedicated to forwarding the policies and uh, procedures in the school district. I've been, uh, served as a president of the Santa Clarita Valley Trustees Association. I've been very active in the County Trustees Association and I've been very active in the California School Boards Association, serving as their president in 2005, uh, as well as spending six years on the board of directors for the National School Boards Association. So I hope that my experience will lead you to vote for me uh, come November 5th. Thank you, an open, opening statement from Lori McDonald. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lori McDonald, and I'm running for election to the Sulphur Springs School Board this November. Let me tell you a little about myself. I've been a middle school educator for Los Angeles Unified School District for the last 15 years. I currently teach physical education, but I have also taught technology, science, health, math, and a summer bridge program for incoming sixth grade students. I've been the PTSA president at the school I work at, and I have a master's degree in administrative education. I have served on the Leona Cox School Site Council. I'm involved with the Leona Cox PTA. I'm extremely involved in youth sports in our community, and I have been for the past 14 years, both as a coach and a referee. I've been married to my amazing husband and extremely supportive husband, Kevin, for the last 13 years. We have three wonderful children. Our two youngest attend Leona Cox as a kindergarten and fifth grade student. Our oldest graduated from Leona Cox Sierra Vista in Canyon High School. And I am the only board member and candidate who currently has children in our local schools. 
I believe that all children deserve a high quality education with high academic standards as well as enrichment in the arts, physical education, and technology. I've been honored to serve as a governing board member of the Sulphur Springs District since 2012. My credentials, accomplishments, and continued dedication in my community won my appointment to the board over all, over can all other candidates. In conclusion, I'm an ideal representative of our community, and I have a vast knowledge of today's educational concerns through experience working with students, parents, staff, and our community members in various roles. I'm a teacher who also has an administrative credential, and I'm a parent with children currently in our schools. I'm dedicated to the families of Sulphur Springs. Please vote for me. Thank you. Thank you. Now, again, uh, voters in the Sulphur Springs Union School District will see four names on their ballot for school board. Uh, the four are Ken Chase, he's the one challenger. And then you've got three incumbents, and they are Michael Hogan, Kerry Clegg, and Lori McDonald. Michael Hogan isn't here, he declined the invitation to participate. So with that, we're gonna go straight into the question and answer phase of this uh, candidates forum. First question is going to come from Perry Smith from AM 1220 KHTS, and the first to answer it will be Lori McDonald. Thanks, Leon. A mother comes to you and says she's upset because her child is having trouble being bullied for having a social disorder, such as autism. How do you think a board member should respond to the parent, and what should be done on the school's end to address the parent's concern? Um, as an educator myself, we, I deal with bullying in the schools quite often. Um, I would first make sure that the principal of our school is aware of the problem. Um, I imagine they are. It's pretty apparent. Um, often in elementary schools, especially when children are being bullied. Um, and our children with special needs need to have that um, extra attention. Um, uh, the parents of the bullying, the child who has a special needs also um, need to be talked with and find out what's really going on um, and move on from there. So it needs to be forwarded to the schools and I would help to make sure that it is being addressed that way. Same question, Ken Chase. Um, I, I would first try to ascertain what the parent has done to make sure the school district is, is being responsive and I would direct her in the, the, um, in the right direction. Um, I, I would, um, if there's a problem, I would talk to the superintendent, see what the school district has done to address the problem, make sure he is aware of the problem. Um, as a parent of a child with type 1 diabetes who has special medical needs, I, I realize how um, the most number one thing in the district is for not only the child to be comfortable, but also for the parent to be comf comfortable because there's a long time out of their, your day where you're trusting the school for the care of your child. So it's very important for the district to make sure that the child is taken care of and that the parent is at ease. And um, as a parent, it's when you're not at ease with your child with a special needs, it's a very unsettling feeling. The question goes to Kerry Clegg. Okay, well, first of all, the, the issue really arises with what, what power does the board member have to try and help a parent in, in this sort of situation. And generally, as uh, Mr. Chase has just said, one of the first things we can do is at least advise them in terms of what the proper procedures are for them to try and work their way up. At the same time, it's important that the board members communicate with the superintendent issues that come to them because the superintendent has the authority to make the changes that might be necessary for a parent to, uh, to alleviate these kinds of problems. Unfortunately, uh, most board members do not have direct authority to do anything at a particular school site, but they do have authority to see that the superintendent is investigating and carrying out the proper procedures. As a board member, we establish what policies would be established in the school district, which include anti-bullying policies and other uh, issues that parents should be able to handle and a procedural me method for the parents to take. And it's our job really to direct those parents in the proper procedure to go ahead and try and get their problem alleviated. If that doesn't happen, then perhaps other issues could be brought up with a superintendent as to why those policies weren't being implemented. And we're going to come right back to Kerry Clegg with the, with, as the first to answer the next question, which comes from Taylor Villanueva from COC Cougar News. Not that long ago, it wouldn't have been beyond the realm of possibilities to see a biblical verse such as a proverb written on a chalkboard in a classroom. What would be your reaction if you saw this on a smart board while you're making a visit to classrooms? Well, it depends on the the proverb was being utilized up on the school board. If it is being used as a teaching tool about a uh, literary device, which one can do in, in, in the school that's perfectly within the, the 
purview of the parents or and the teacher to, to do that in the school thing. On the other hand, if it was being utilized to proselytize about some particular religious belief, then I would be sure that I would uh, express my uh, problem with that with the uh, principal of that school site as well as to tell the superintendent about the issues that I have and make sure that it is not a teacher who is involved in trying to forward a particular religious issue in, in, in their particular uh, classroom. But as things going, having proverbs that come from the Bible as literary devices is not counter to the separation of church and state. Same question, Lori McDonald. Um, there is a separation of church and state, and I think Carrie very well answered it. Um, just because there's a proverb up on the on the board, on the smart board for students to discuss does not necessarily mean it's in a religious context. Um, if it is being discussed in a religious context, then we need to make sure that um, it's being covered in all basis. But it is it, it is a, a, a red flag to make sure that it's being covered appropriately um, and not crossing over the, the legal bounds that uh, you're allowed to. Um, but just because it's a proverb that comes from a, a religious quote does not mean that it's meant in a religious way, but it can um, intrigue thought and discussion um, into morals or other topics as well. And the question goes to Ken Chase. Well, it's really hard to differentiate um, my answer than what they previously said. Um, I think it's a very, a very straight issue. Um, but it's to make sure that um, it's covered more on a historical basis, and that's going to come up probably not as much in elementary school as it would in, in middle school or high school, but um, that can still come. And, and there's, I think, a lot of issue come up when other religions are brought up, and usually when the Muslim faith is brought up, that seems to be the most controversial. But again, it's, it's, it needs to be on a historical context, not a religious context. Um, obviously, religion. Um, plays a big part in the in world history, um, and um, as far as the management, really um, on the spot in the classroom, I don't think it would be appropriate to do anything, but to bring it up outside the classroom with the principal and the superintendent. Next question comes from Luke Money from the Signal, and it goes first to Ken Chase. One of the governing board's most important roles is oversight of the district's executive staff. Based on your knowledge of the challenges facing the districts, what qualities would you look for if you were faced with the choice of choosing a new superintendent? You know, I think that's uh, very possible that that will come up in the next four years, um, certainly the next ten. Um, we have a great superintendent who's been in the district. I, I think there, there's very, two um, two sides of the district. You, you need to make sure someone is very educational, um, well-rounded, um, also has very financial background, um, and that can run both the education, what the, the service we provide to our students and our parents, and also to make sure that the district um, stays fiscally responsible. And a big part of that is to make sure they have great management skills to oversee the employees of the district, especially the uh, assistant superintendents, and to check in the, um, what experience they have in that area and make sure it fills the needs of the district. Same question to Kerry Clegg. Okay, well, as I understand it, we, you know, the first thing is that the school board, the only person that the school board actually has direct authority over and, and hiring authority is the superintendent. So we don't really supervise any of the other uh, uh, higher staff but it is important that the, that the school board does hire a superintendent that meets the entire needs or as close of the needs of the school district. And therefore, during that process, uh, it, it's important that the school board participates in the interview process and looks for those characteristics that one that the staff will support as well as the community will support since that's what we are really representing uh, as school board members, the community input into that school district. And it's going to be a very difficult choice if we do have to look for a new superintendent in the next four years because the current superintendent we've, we've had has been very successful uh, in meeting the needs of not only the community but the children in the Sulphur Springs School District. But uh, I'm sure that uh, the process that we have established will, will find a, a, an adequate sub, uh, position. The question goes to Lori McDonald. Thank you. Um, 
I believe our superintendent needs to share the vision of our school district and um, that's something that we would be looking for. We'd be going through interviews and um, getting input not just from ourselves but as Carrie said from um, the other stakeholders in our community, the, our, our parents, uh, our community, the teachers, the, our existing administration. Um, and as school board member, uh, the superintendent is the one person that we have direct supervision over. Um, so it's important that we make sure that we make the right choice. We have a very informed choice um, to do. Um, thank you. Okay, you're watching the 2013 Sulphur Springs Union School District Candidates Forum, and uh, it's brought to you by the Signal newspaper, by COC Cougar News, by AM 1220KHTS, and SCV TV. And if you miss any portion of it, you're going to be able to see and or read about it in all sorts of different places. You got hometownstation.com, you got cougarnews.com, signalscv.com, and scvtv.com. So all these dot coms. Uh, we're going to have time for one more question before we take a quick break. The question's going to come from Perry Smith from KHTS, and it's going to go first to Lori McDonald. Thanks, Leon. What's one area where the school district successfully <clears throat> addresses a challenge and where's one area where the solution could be improved and how would you improve it? Um, a challenge. I believe uh, our current challenge is our, the Common Core State Standards that are coming up um, in how to address those needs the best. We, I think we already have a good leg up on that we have uh, a lot of technology available to our district already that we just currently did a, a huge upgrade to our system. Um, you know, we are luckily that we're more prepared for the common standards to uh, do those assessments and have our children already addressing um, to be well prepared to uh, take the common core standards. Um, our teachers and our administrators are already working. We're already uh, doing professional development to have our teachers ready. And we're already working on delivering the common uh, core standards to our children already so they will be prepared. And I think we're addressing it very well. Question goes to Ken Chase. Well, I, I think where uh, the district could have done better is really planning, um, being more proactive versus reactive with the state budget. Um, unfortunately, every periodically the California budget does a downturn, and it really hurts our schools. And um, a lot of the schools are forced to do layoffs and a lot of cuts. And with the recent downturn, um, cuts are going to be inevitable. But I think what the district could do, have done better is um, plan, set a higher reserve so that um, when the downturn comes that there's money to keep teachers because not only do you have the human resource element of that, um, there, there's also the business side of that um, and both are very important because now as, as the uh, money comes back and we can replace uh, the laid off teachers, um, we're going to have, uh, you know, we're going to have to have training costs and stuff, which can be avoided. The question goes to Carrie Clegg. Well, after hearing Mr. Chase, I actually have to change my answer because I, I think part of his, his response to this really needs some clarification. I, I, in a lot of ways, I think his response about the, the budget and the proactiveness of our budgeting process is a little bit naive. Uh, in, in one sense, this district has maintained and has maintained well above what the state requires as a minimum reserve in order to try and plan ahead and, and make sure that the, that the budget downturns uh, are not as effective as they were. Nobody foresaw that in 2006 the state was going to, uh, the entire national economy was going to crash and that the state was also going to have some really serious budget problems that resulted in a 22% cut across the board to school districts in terms of their finances. Nobody is going to survive a 22% cut to their total finance without having some issues with personnel and layoffs. And I think our district, with the reserves that we had and we maintained, minimized more so than most districts the amount of personnel that were actually laid off. Um, and, and in that process, we've, we've been very successful at keeping our programs going and our students successful. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break and come right back with more of the 2013 Sulphur Springs Union School District Candidates Forum. Can 
lead to great things. Find out how a healthy lifestyle can help your child succeed. Welcome back to the 2013 Sulphur Springs Union School District Candidates Forum brought to you by KHTS, The Signal, COC Cougar News, and SCV TV. We've got three of the four candidates for school board in the Sulphur Springs Union School District with us today. The challenger, Ken Chase, the incumbents, uh, Carrie Clegg, and Lori McDonald. Now we're going to change things up a little bit right now. Nobody's been warned about this. So uh, what we're going to do is give each of the candidates an opportunity to ask one of the other candidates a question. And beginning with Carrie Clagg, uh, each candidate will have 15 seconds in which to phrase the question, and then the person at whom it's aimed will have 60 seconds to respond. You don't have to take advantage of this opportunity. But should you choose to uh, ask one of the other candidates a question, Carrie. Uh, who would that be and what would your question be? I'm trying to think of the 15 seconds. Is it, is it clicking right now? Uh, I, I think I would, I would uh, ask Ken Chase uh, what is the basis for which he's criticizing the school board for not having been fiscally responsible during, this, during the uh, um, current fiscal crisis that the state is recovering from uh, relative to our the budget that the Silver Spring School District has had. Can't change 60 seconds. You know, um, I was at a candidate forum for the uh, Newhall board um, on Thursday night. There was multiple, the uh, Santa Clarita Valley PTA Council did uh, multiple um, um, forums. And I, the Newhall board is touting that they didn't have to lay anybody, any teachers off. And um, although Kerry called it naive, um, I don't think it's naive to realize that the California budget isn't always glor glorious in that it goes in cycles. And so for one thing I would do is um, in escrow there's the, um, the Canyon uh, Theater Center um, that uh, it's going to generate $5.5 million. I, I, would, uh, I would like to see that money set aside for the next time the California budget takes a downturn. So that money is there to um, retain teachers and um, so to avoid layoffs, avoid having re-recruit teachers when the budget returns, having to retrain teachers, and in the long run, that's going to save the district some money. Laurie McDonald, uh, you want to ask somebody something? And if so, who and what do you want to know? I'll uh, decline. You'll, OK. Next, Ken? Mm, um, I'll decline. Okay, with that, we're going to return to um, the question and answer session. Taylor Villanueva from COC Cougar News. And uh, let's see, we would then start with uh, Ken Chase to be the first to answer. Speaking of managing the budget, reports from Sacramento recently revealed that the state fell hundreds of million dollars short on the funding promises made by Proposition 30. If the school districts began to receive their full funding guaranteed by Propositions 30 and 98, what would your top priority be and why? Um, part of my top priority would be to retain some of that money. So uh, as I've been touting is so that the next time we take a downturn is, you know, I'd like to see the budget as level as possible. And, and I know you can't have it completely level, but to make it as, as void the peaks and valleys as much as possible. Um, there's just, uh, with the money coming back, I mean, currently the uh, school districts or science labs aren't being fully utilized. Um, in schools that are, it's more through PTA, um, PTA gifts. Um, we're also going to have an issue with the new technology. The district borrow issued bonds for 40 years. That money uh, on technology, that's going to last three to 10 years. Um, we need to make sure that, that some of that money is set aside so that we can replace that equipment as it as it gets aged and it, we don't get in a situation um, where we can no longer fully utilize it. Question goes to Gary Clegg. 
Uh, well, if, the way I understand it is that if the state actually fully funded Prop 98 and Prop 30, what would we do with the, with the additional money? Uh, in, in many ways, that would uh, really restore the district to a, a much better condition than it has been in, in the last few years. We've lost over $6 million out of $34 uh, million in terms of our budget, uh, which is a very large chunk. And, and in the bi biggest part, we have not actually laid off very many teachers, but the district as a whole, we've lost um, teachers based upon a um, they, that have retired. We allowed attrition and some other things to take and re minimize the amount of teachers that, that were on the layoff list. Uh, as well, we're in a declining enrollment situation, so we cannot staff above a certain ratio based upon the state formulas uh, in terms of that. So. We would, uh, we would utilize the money to restore a lot of the programs that we, that we did minimize and cut because of the, the budget downturn. Um, seriously, we have established a fairly decent sinking fund, and that's what the sale of the property was actually utilized to do, was to put it into a Thank you. escrow account. Time on that. Sorry, but uh, Lori McDonald, next to answer. Um, when new money comes to a school district, uh, First, we have the local control funding formula, where it's still unclear how that's going to turn out and uh, how we can spend the money, how we can use the money. It's, it changes from day to day. It's coming a little bit more clear, um, but not completely. Um, Sometimes you only can use that money in specific ways, and that's a lot that the public doesn't realize. Um, a lot of it's one-time money. You have to spend it by the end of the school year, um, or you lose it. Um, so as schools, districts, we have to have a plan of how we want to use that. And as we get additional funds, um, we've already been talking about on the board and what we want to restore and how we want to do it. I think it's good to uh, also consider to give uh, the choice to the community, to the parents and the schools and how they want to best spend any money that we may be able to have allocating, allocated to them. Um, and I think enrichment and intervention is important. Um, enrichment in the arts, the physical education, and technology. We definitely need to keep our teachers uh, professionally developed so they are current with uh, trends. And we just invested in a bunch of technology, and we already have a plan uh, to continue with that. Speaking of money, the next question is going to come from Luke Money from The Signal, and it's going to go first to Lori McDonald. What is your view on charter schools? And would you consider approving one if you thought it met a need in the community served by the Silver Springs School District? Why or why not? That's an involved question. Um, <laughs> charter schools, um, I, I have nothing against charter schools. I think they're good in, in an area where they're, they're needed. I don't think our valley, um, the entire Santa Clara Valley, I don't think any of our schools in the valley have a need for a charter school. Um, but they do have their place. Um, they definitely be look, need to be looked at their, um, their instructional program, uh, how they are funding themselves, because they're a public school program just like we're a public school program, and they're overseen um, by the governing board of the district that they're in, uh, which if they were to go to Sulphur Springs, that would be us. Um, so that also reflects upon us and how we choose. If they are a failing school district, that would reflect poorly on us. So we need to make sure um, that they are fiscally sound, that they're instructionally sound. Um, and if we're not meeting the needs of a particular uh, group in our school districts, I would hope that we would become aware of it and be able to address it ourselves before we would go to a charter school. Question goes to Ken Chase. I, I feel that um, anything that creates competition in the school systems is a, is a good thing. And um, in charter schools is part of that. And I feel that um, if a charter school came before the board and it met the various criteria of the state that um, is needed to implement the charter school, they had a good plan, they had a good budget, um, that, sh that would show that they're successful, I would vote in favor of it. Obviously, if they were unable to show that, I would be against it. Um, but what I would like to see is that the schools, um, the Sulphur Springs School District come out on top and that having charter schools would make us that much better. Charter schools in 60 seconds, Kerry Clegg. Well, it's going to be tough. Um, I have no problem with charter schools if the charter schools are in fact following what the pur purpose of the original charter school law was intended for, and that is that they provide 
uh, innovative programs that are not available in the districts and the areas in which they're supposed to be and that they serve all students including low income and uh, special ed students which many charters in fact do not do in terms of their programs. Uh, we have had some issues with charter schools in the Sulphur Springs School District and, and most of the, the ones that we have looked at and reviewed their charters, their uh, educational program as well as their plan for special ed students and low income students did not meet um, the proper muster and, and, and therefore we would not support those kinds of things, schools. If they in fact came in as Ken Chase said with a novel program that, that was uh, designed to help all students in the district and something that, they, that our school district couldn't provide and they met all of the state's criteria then, then the school board would vote for it and I would vote for it as well. Next question is going to go back to Carrie Clegg, and it's going to come from KHTS News Director Perry Smith. All of the local public school districts are losing funding, uh, the funding that they receive, which is based on attendance, due to the growing popularity of charter and private schools in the Santa Clarita Valley. Is there anything the Sulphur Springs School District can do to lessen the impacts of this? Well, what the Sulphur Springs School District is doing and has been doing is, is to provide a superior program for the students in our district that allows them to be successful uh, and if the criteria has to be the state testing then we're, we're one of the highest uh, uh, amongst the highest in the state most of our nine, eight out of our nine schools are above the state's uh, 800 target and the other one is very close uh, we provide have excellent staff staff development and uh, we've moved into a professional uh, learning community formula which has been very successful at, at uh, allowing for um, uh, cross um, grade uh, help and as well as within grade uh, uh, help between the teachers. And the students are becoming very successful and they're doing well on their tests and we're working very hard to bring our lowest performing students up so that our scores remain high. And I think if you provide them with an attractive, successful environment, there's no need for our parents to go to charter schools. Same question to Laurie McDonald. Um, Gary, you answered it very well. Um, our charter schools in our district, I, I, I think our school districts, our school is doing, our school district is doing very well. Um, our parents, um, I think, are being well served. Our children are being well served. Um, and I forgot the rest of your question. <laughs> You can restate it. Sure. Uh, basically, a, a lot of, while, while they're, uh, this, the Sulphur Springs School District is doing a great job serving uh, its students, it is still losing um, enrollments to private schools and charter schools. Uh, and what can the district do to address the concerns of parents who might be taking their children out of a oh. public school and putting them into a charter school? In Not, about 30 more seconds. So I, I think we continue doing what we're doing because I have complete faith in our school district. I think we're doing a really good job. And I, we're finding, uh, we're having, Families that have left our school district to go to the charter schools are coming back, and some of them coming, are coming back dissatisfied. Thank you. Again, Chase? Yeah, I, I think I addressed a lot of this in my previous answer, but we make some Sulphur Springs schools the best schools in, um, that their kids can attend. And um, I do think we have great teachers, and um, we do provide a great education um, and you know with the current board I have no qualms about the education they're providing and um, I'm you know more looking at the finance side so I think uh, just keep on providing um, a great education uh, great communication with the, the um, with the parents keep it um, children with special needs learning disabilities keep on um, providing the best education we can for all all sectors of, of the school district and um, not give them a reason to go anywhere else. And no matter what you do, some people might think the grass is greener on the, on the other side, but um, keep that to a minimum. You're watching the 2013 Sulphur Springs Union School District Candidates Forum. We're gonna take a quick break and wrap it up. Are you getting this, honey? Oh, prime time. We are rolling. <laughs> Mama's gonna bring it home. Mama's okay. gonna bring it home. Okay. Okay. Come on. Watch this guy. Oh, backwards. Oh. Don't. Oh. It went into Bob and Carol's yard. Oh. No? Okay. Yeah. Here it is. Oh. Oh. oh, my God. Challenge your kids to be active and eat healthy. All right. Let's see what you can do. Let's go. They might surprise you. Search We Can for more ideas on how you and your kids can get healthy together. 
Don't look at me. Your hair's a bit frizzy today. Oh, you should pick that up. Every day, kids <laughs> witness bullying. Poor you. They want to help, but don't know how. Teach your kids how to be more than a bystander. Visit stopbullying.gov. Welcome back to the 2013 Sulphur Springs Union School District Candidates Forum, brought to you by The Signal Newspaper, AM 1220 KHTS, COC Cougar News, and SCV TV. There are four candidates running for school board in the uh, Sulphur Springs Union School District, three incumbents and one challenger. The challenger is with us today, and he is Ken Chase. Two of the incumbents are here, Carrie Clegg and Lori McDonald. Next question comes from Taylor Villanueva from COC Cougar News, and it's going to go first to Ken Chase. What would you say to someone who felt that there should only be one elementary school district to service the Santa Clarita Valley, and why? You know, one, one thing I like about Sulphur Springs School District, um, I think the size is perfect. It's, it's, um, it's small enough where you get to know everybody. Um, I mean, I've known the superintendent very well for 2000. 2004. I've known all the board members very well since 2004, uh, except you know Lori since she's um, come aboard. And I really like that small. I think it gives a very cl um, nice hometown feel, and that everybody's approachable. Um, that you can get your issues addressed. Um, as I mentioned with my daughter with type one diabetes, and you get very involved with the district and. I've always been able to approach everyone, and I think that's um, a great, great asset. And I think if uh, all the all the districts combined, you would lose that, and I I don't feel I have that with the heart district, like I um, like where my children are, like I do with the um, did with the Sulphur Springs district. The consolidation question, Kerry Clegg. <laughs> Well, it's very interesting that, that you should ask this question because it's gone around in our community and all of the communities for many times about whether we should unify and form one single district. A, a single uh, elementary idea is, is sort of a novel way of, of approaching to it, but the reality of, of the Santa Clarita Valley is that there are um, culturally very different uh, teaching cultures and philosophies in, in all of the, uh, the four elementary districts that are out here. And, and not any one is any better than the other. We all do, are all very successful and, and do very well. And I think what Ken was saying is important that the, that the community feel of the Sulphur Springs School District, just as, just as the community feel of the Newhall School District, is what attracts people to come from the valley and from the other areas and bring their kids into our, our school district. The smallness and the closeness and the ability to approach principals, teachers, uh, even up to the superintendent and board members, members in these smaller districts is very important to our communities. Question goes to Lori McDonald. Um, as both Carrie and Ken said, I, I agree with both of them. When my family moved here from um, Los Angeles Unified in 2002, that was part of the draw to this area was uh, the Santa Clarita Valley, the safety unit, and our school district. Um, we have nine elementary schools. Um, you know, my kid, my, my kids know kids from other schools. Um, in Los Angeles Unified, you don't know your neighbors, you don't know the people in your school. They're coming from all over the place, and um, I don't like that out there. It's completely different out here. It's what I appreciate. Um, I've never met the superintendent of the Los Angeles Unified School District, and I met the superintendent before I was on the board several times. I met the board members several times. Um, the teachers come out to the events. We're, we're a tight fit, fit, tight fit family um, in our district. Um, and each of the other districts, we all have our own uh, you know, needs that we address in different way. Canyon Country is different than Valencia, is different from Stevenson's Ranch, is different than Newhall, and we're able to address uh, the needs of our community very well. Next question is going to go back to Lori McDonald. It's going to come from Luke Money from The Signal. The Common Core State Standards Initiative is without a question going to be changing the way schools are teaching subjects in our classroom. As some of you brought up earlier, a big reason that Silver Springs has so much new technology in the classroom is because of teaching Common Core. Why is something like a smart board so much better than a chalkboard for teaching our students? And what are your views on technology in general being used as a teaching tool in the classroom? I think technology as a teaching tool, I've, I've uh, taught myself using technology. Um, in today's society, uh, we can get kids more involved. Um, we have the information at our fingertips. It's got our teachers excited, which gets our kids excited. 
Um, it, it, they're able to be more interactive. We, uh, we can spread out with the iPads that we have. It's not just one kid at the board, it's several kids. We can display all their work up at a smart board. Um, just the limits are, you have less limits than if you were just to have a chalkboard. And um, it really has enabled our, our teachers to enhance their instruction that much more. And please come see our classrooms because they're wonderful. And our teachers are excited and our kids are excited. And it's, thank you. Question goes to Ken Chase. You know, the, the ideas on the smart board is, is to more engage the students. And I, I think, uh, you know, a, a smart board in the classroom does a very, very good job of that. Um, but, you know, and technology as far as the recent upgrades to the um, wide area network and uh, it is part of current day infrastructure. But you also got to make sure you don't go too far. For instance, um, I think there's plans to put a second smart board in classrooms. I don't think that's necessary. Um, they recently installed a lot of uh, every classroom with a smart board and they replaced existing smart boards that was working. They just uh, made 158 smart boards obsolete at their last meeting to accomplish that. So also uh, science labs hasn't, haven't been utilized and there was an idea as well why don't we just have a lesson taught at a, at a, in a science lab and then broadcast it to their rooms. And I think that takes away from the advantages of both. The idea of a science lab was to be interactive. The idea of a smart board was to be interactive. And I think that formula would disengage the students. So technology is a good thing, but you also got to make sure um, that it's used properly. Question goes to Carrie Clegg. Yes, thank you. Well, you know, this is a technological society, and if you, if you maintain teaching standards and st teaching protocols and teaching strategies that are in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s, you're going to lose students, you're going to lose, uh, dropout rates are going to increase, and you're going to uh, have parents that are bolting for the private schools and the charter schools that may have those, those particular advantages. So in fact, the, the, the use of smart boards and smart technology in the classroom is really an advancement that is designed to keep our students engaged and our teachers excited about the teaching uh, strategies that they have and the ability to utilize these things. My two-year-old grandson can work the TV changer for the cable box better than I can. And so, you know, if you didn't, are not uh, staying in tune and moving it forward with the kinds of educational and learning um, strategies that work with kids, then you're just not going to be successful. And I think that we've done a great job as a district at staying ahead of that problem. And the final question today is going to go first to Kerry Clegg, and it's going to come from KHTS News Director Perry Smith. Uh, if there is a decision that has to be made, uh, at all things being equal, between uh, teacher layoffs and cutting a program uh, at school sites district-wide, uh, how do you make that decision and, and how do you evaluate that? Well, it's a, it's a very difficult decision. When we, when we do have uh, choices to make between uh, teachers and, and pro programs, it usually has to do with, one, how many students do we have and how many teachers do we have that, that determines how many uh, teachers may be on that particular uh, layoff list. And as well, the programs have to do with whether or not the program is meeting its needs, it's successful, and it's being funded by the state. As you know, or, or uh, in terms of the fi this last fiscal crisis, many of the uh, categorical programs that the state was funding piecemeal basically were lumped in and said, well, go ahead and utilize whatever you want from that funds in any way that you can to save uh, either teacher salaries or, or uh, uh, other things, and that's what we did for those kinds of categorical programs. I think the state has finally come around to realizing that the old piecemeal way of funding programmatic issues is not, go is not viable. This is why they've gone to this local control funding formula, which is going to be more student needs based in terms of how it comes to the district, and I think at that point we can make those kinds of decisions uh, thoughtfully. Thank you, Lori McDonald. Um, that's exactly where I was going to go with the local control funding formula. Um, there is m money that's attached to um, to the kids, and the decisions are being given to the schools, to the districts, on how to best spend that money to fit your school, to fit your district. Um, whereas before, is if you want this money, you have to do this program, and. Uh, 
it doesn't work that way. It, every school is different. You can't do a cookie cutter to say this is how you do this and this is the money we're going to do to fund it. And as we've seen before, you pull the money and it goes. If you give us the money um, and give us the decisions how to use that money best in our, in, you know, in our environment, in our schools, let us be the best uh, we know our kids. You know, let us be the best, uh, make the best decision on how to spend it. And if we decide we need a, a lower class size ratio or a certain type of program to fund that, um, with this type of funding, that's what we can choose, what fits best. And the question goes to Ken Chase. Hopefully I can answer the question a little bit more directly. Um, my opinion is teachers come first. Um, because there's the human resource, you know, you, you want teachers, um, they're, they're the backbone to our education and they're what makes our classrooms thrive. So any decision, really the teachers um, need to be the, layoffs need to be the last thing. And, you know, I have stated earlier um, to be proactive years before the, uh, before you get into trouble on the budget. and. Um, also, that way you don't have to retrain them when you bring them when you after you lay off teachers. Um, so, uh, any other program I would put first before teachers um, to make sure that's what's necessary for the uh, district to survive in the long run and to be the most efficient and provide the best benefit to our children. That wraps up the question and the answer portion of this 2013 Sulphur Springs Union School District candidates forum. I'd like to thank our panel of journalists. From the Signal, we had uh, Luke Money, from COC Cougar News, Taylor Villanueva, and from KHTS AM 1220, Perry Smith. And now we uh, wrap up with a 90-second closing statement from each of the candidates, beginning with uh, Ken Chase. Thank you for having me here. Here, I'd like to thank um, Signal, College of the Canyons, KHTS, and San Clarita Valley TV. Um, I've lived in this district for over 20 years. Um, I think it's a great district. Um, unfortunately, there is not an accountant on the board. I'm a certified management accountant. I can add a lot of insight to the board as, as issues come up to add a different perspective. And with that, um, I think I feel I presented a lot of issues that need to be addressed in the district to make a, a good district even better. And for that, I hope that you'll vote for me um, November 5th. Thank you. Gary Clegg. Well, uh, thank you. I, I also want to thank all the members of uh, the panel from uh, uh, KHTS and the College of the Canyons and the Signal for their time and SCB TV for providing this candidate forum for, me, for us. Uh, I, I think that I have uh, demonstrated over 24 years of experience and dedication to the district. I had five children that, that went through the school district uh, and, and uh, Pine Tree Elementary School and have gone on and become successful in our community. And I now have grandchildren that will soon be entering our school district. So I'm looking forward to continuing to, to serve the needs of the students in our district. Uh, all of the years that I have spent on the school district has been dedicated to furthering the policies and procedures um, that have made this district successful. Um, there are some continued issues that we have to do with the, with the spending of the Measure CK bond funds that I would like to oversee and make sure that they are uh, uh, spent as we had advertised to our uh, constituents. And I hope that my experience and my dedication to the district is sufficient to have the voters uh, continue to support me and vote for me. Thank you. And you get the final word today, Lori McDonald. Thank you. Um, I believe I'm an ideal uh, representative for the Sulphur Springs School Board. Um, I have a vast knowledge of today's educational concerns. Um, I'm involved in our community. I'm a teacher. I'm a mom. Um, my kids are in the school. I'm the only candidate and current board member with kids in the school district. Um, I'm the only female running for this um, election cycle, and I'm one of two females that's currently on the board. Um, I believe I'm an asset to the school board, and please vote for me. Thank you. Well, that wraps up the 2013 Sulphur Springs Union School District Candidates Forum. On behalf of the Signal Newspaper, KHTS, COC Cougar News, and SCB TV, I'd like to thank the three candidates for joining us today. Uh, Ken Chase, Carrie Clegg, Lori McDonald. 
I'm Leon Warden, reminding you to vote on November 5th.